you introduce yourself and get on with the talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Chris, Chris Basler. Uh, I'm a solutions architect with Google, and as solution architects, we are between the cloud and all the services and the customers, because in the cloud, all the teams that provide the services, they all implement the services, and there's hundreds of them. However, when you are from a coming from a customer perspective, you have a problem or two that you want to solve, and you kind of come there, and you, have, you see all these services out there, and you ask the question, how do I implement my problem? How do I solve my problem? with all what's out there, and that's where we come into play, how to connect all of this. And you're going to see this in play here because I'm doing the opposite of the previous speaker. The previous speaker here in this room went all to all the details of InfluxDB, and I'm going to go all the way to the other spectrum where InfluxDB is a box out of many boxes from an architectural perspective. And so I embed this architecture discussion into the context of IoT events, in the energy um, sector. So here, quick agenda. So first, let's talk about the energy sectors, only one slide. Then let's look at the use case analysis. How would a use case be analyzed from an architectural perspective, especially in a cloud context? Um, then we go through a life cycle of an event a little bit, and then I try to embed all of this into the um, Google Cloud and pick architecture, resulting into a larger architecture uh, representation. It's just an example. Uh, to get some idea around all of that. So the energy sector has like a production, a distribution, and consumption side of the house. There's probably more details around it. But when you think about production, then these days we produce energy in lots of places that have the potential to be monitored, of course, in many, many different ways, in different areas with connectivity issues or not, and, and all these combinations. So there's a lot of space to monitor. And of course, IoT is the one way of doing it. Um, in the distribution side, you have the basic problem of making sure that the demand and the supply uh, matches. And of course, there's more and more monitoring being embedded in order to make this match happen so that you don't have too much energy or too little at any point in time. And so there is like a lot of work happening right now in this space. And they're even introducing devices to monitor the supply and demand side, like these synchrophasers. And now they're also starting to go into machine learning to not just monitor and try to derive it, but maybe learn from behavior in the past to somehow predict the behavior in the future. And then, of course, there's consumption. You have fleets of cars, trucks, planes, robots, what not. There's uh, commercial manufacturing facilities. Like many, many years back in the Silicon Valley, between two and four on a hot day, all these manufacturing facilities were turning on the air conditioners and the grid broke down, right? I mean, you want to avoid that. Um, you have a public infrastructure and you have a private household. So all of this is needs to be monitored and, and maintained and controlled and probably forecast at the same time. And, and these environments are big, right? I mean, if you look at the US as a grid or if you look at continents as a grid, this is not like a local environment anymore. It's really a wide environment. So how we, if we analyze that, what we analyze, your event collection is from producing, producing systems from consumption systems, and of course there's the trick of the absence check. What if a device goes dead? How do you know it went dead, right? I mean, you need to do the negative check. So all of a sudden you have event data or missing event data, but how do you know they're missing? There needs to be an inventory of devices somewhere that says, okay, there should be an event, but there is no event. How do you detect that? Um, you have event monitoring, outages, trends, anomalies. But if it's an anomaly, is it really an outage or not? Or maybe just the communication broke down? Right? So when you have your PGE smart meter and it doesn't tell you 10 hours of data, well, is the energy not there or is the smart meter down? How do you kind of deal with that? You have to monitor it. You probably have some past experience that you can draw on to figure this out. And of course, you have forecasting. And forecasting is a combination of many things like current events, historic events, uh, non-event data like models, weather data, road conditions, all of this combined. So there's a huge amount of services you might need in order to get the information together, evaluate it, and predict um, down the road. Of course, in the very end, you do archiving for long duration analysis. And there was this one hurricane in the Atlantic, and they just said it was the biggest one since 1859. So here we have a time horizon of event collection right there, which long-term duration is really important for these kind of analysis and, and predictions. So, so what's the life cycle of an event? So here's one event that was issued by a device. Whatever the device is, might be any type of device. It's ingested into the 
processing of this event, and then it usually ends up in a transduce database. We can guess which one. And um, write that database might have some real-time analysis facility that you can just look at stuff right now as the events are coming in, right? So it's very important. You monitor, you look at it. It's all happening at this point in time. And so the analy analysis, the analytics, looks at the current state of the events that you know about in that time series database. And if you switch it on yesterday, then you have only one day of history. If it was switched on a year ago, then you have one year of data, maybe, maybe not. But the limit of the analytics is whatever's in this time series database. Now, we might want to do some offline analytics as well. So we have um, maybe a, a fleet management system out there that w wants to analyze across the fleet what's happening to the fleet and where the different vehicles are at this point in time and the, where they might be going. So these events that are collected, so if this was an, a, a vehicle, these events have to go into these analytic systems that are not part of the time series database, but they have separate subsystems all together out there. And they might be based on static data, like the inventory of all the um, vehicles you have, and they might be based on some dynamic data sources like their location and, and their, their state of maintenance, what have you. Right? So, so these events are also useful, not just by looking at what's happening right now, but they're also useful in feeding into other systems that are looking at these and analyzing these events. And then you might have a lot of application systems that need these events. And one of these application systems might be a monitoring system that monitors already events out there. It was established a while back, but it was using different technology so the blue event here tries to indicate that there might be events already in my infrastructure that should be going back into the time series space to be able to uh, correlate them right now with the hot data that I have at this point in time. Right? So this is not just a one-way flow from a time series collection point to other systems. It might also be that other systems might feed in back events into the current data set that I'm looking at. And of course, then you have the, um, the short or long-term archiving of these events so you can go back to them in terms of years or maybe even centuries uh, to come. All right, so how is this all kind of embedded here? You have a representation of the Google Cloud data centers. So each blue dot or white dot is a data center. It's called a region. And the region is usually a geographic region and each dot has at least three data centers. So the numbers inside are the number of data centers and each data center has thousands of millions of machines. So this is the distribution as we have it right now. And you see it's pretty much covering. And um, this allows you to write global applications. This allows you to put devices everywhere feeding into the same system no matter where they are. So the viewpoint you can take using the Google Cloud is a global viewpoint. You don't have to worry about any more uh, geographic segregation in terms of I do something for the US only. You can always implement global and restrict the data set to the US, but you don't have to restrict the architecture to the US. That's an important aspect. Now, a second aspect is that when you look at the Google network, these are Google-owned fiber going across the globe. So as soon as you hit with a request to Google network, you're leaving the internet and you're inside the Google network. And if all your services are inside the Google network, they remain on the private network that Google has. So you have then no competition with anybody else because there is no anybody else except um, you and the Google customers. And because we own the network, we can control the admission to it, we can control the throughput latency and can put out certain uh, optimizations that you couldn't do if you were to go through the public uh, internet. Another interesting aspect is that if you hit your application, no matter where it's running, the path to that application goes through the nearest Google network entry point. So if you have an application running in the US and somebody in Asia accesses it, it actually enters the Google network in Asia and then travels on the Google network to the US in order to have the short latencies and high um, throughput. So that's an important aspect when you think about the scale and the low latency that you might want to have for event processing uh, on a global scale. Now, um, this network is constantly being expanded, of course, because the number of services is increasing and the data sizes are increasing. So what does it mean uh, from a service perspective? So it's just a copy of the uh, website, so you can just go there and look at what all the services are that are available on the Google environment. But I want to call out a few that might be interesting in this context. One is BigQuery. 
So that's a cloud native analytics database. And the term cloud native means is that you do not see the infrastructure of how it's implemented. What you see is a database interface, which means you see the data model you can formulate like a, a schema and you see the query input, but that's the end of it. All the mechanisms underneath that stored data is completely hidden from you and you do not have to manage it whatsoever. You will just see a service, a managed service with an interface and that's a columnar SQL database and it's large scale. So we have customers that have three figures big, uh, petabytes in the system. So no matter how much data you collect, you really can store it there and analyze it. So you're not limited by any other database you have in your system if you want to do a broad range total data set analysis or if you have to uh, do that. Now Cloud Spanner, for example, is a relational online transaction database. It's also cloud native, so you don't see the underlying infrastructure. And it's global in the sense that any access you have anywhere on the planet is consistent. So it's not eventually consistent, it's always consistent, but on a global scale. And the networking we have allows us to implement a time-based service, which is called True Time, that allows us to have consistent time across the globe, which translates into the ability to have a global, a, a consistent native database. So if you want to implement it, an application that is operating in a continent across continents, then Cloud Spanner is a candidate for the underlying relation database system. There's something called code line storage where you can store things long term, cheap and long term with high availability. And um, this allows you to store forever any the amount of data size you have. So the amount of events that you have, you can simply put there. You don't have to think about compressing these events or taking aggregates for storage reasons. You can really store the raw data if you want to, if you expect the raw data in the future to be analyzed. And then there's new services like the machine learning engine that allow you to do machine learning learning and, and then uh, prediction and online and batch predictions that allow you to then feed in data and then do the uh, learning and analysis as you need it. So how does this kind of play into an, an <coughs> overall architecture? So here you have the, the influx DB architecture. I don't have to really explain anything. You all know this. It's just taken from the website. So you have a complete system that can do many things, including storage, analysis, all of that. And we take this as a building block and put it into a global cloud architecture that kind of can process all the different events uh, life cycle as we just uh, introduced it. So, so we have a global service called Cloud IT Core. That global service is global in a sense that it's available everywhere. So if you create an account in Google Cloud, then you can create one of those. And if you have created one of those, then it's a global available service. And this allows you to register any type of IoT device that you have as long as it's complying to certain protocols. That's it. And there's just one of those, and you can put in any device around the globe, anywhere where it is, as long as it's talking that particular protocol. Now, this piece of service has an integration with the tick stack InfluxDB. So whatever events are coming in can be fed into tick. And then you can use the tick interface, the sub tool set to analyze the event data any way which way you need to do that, right? So this gives you a first set of entry points collection processing on a global scale. Now what about all the other things we talked about in terms of the event life cycle? There is a PubSub connector. So PubSub is a uh, topic-based queuing system, published a Strat queuing system. You can create a topic. You can push to that topic. You can subscribe to this topic. That's a global system. If you have created a topic, it's available worldwide. So anywhere on the planet that has a, where you have services running, you can subscribe to this topic, and any data going into this topic is available everywhere. So there's an integration between TIC and PubSub. So this is a way to take the events from uh, InfluxDB, get them available into a PubSub topic, and then you can write, for example, a data flow that takes the events and feeds them into BigQuery, this massive analytical database, relational. You can write your queries. And this user interface symbolizes you can access and run queries for analysis. However, in addition, BigQuery allows you to do a, a, a predicate push down into other databases. So there's a Cloud SQL database, which is, has like, a, for example, a MySQL variant. And so you can write analytics queries that also access uh, the relational system 
uh, MySQL or Postgres in order to combine the data into analytics results. Or you can have other systems feeding into BigQuery that are not necessarily coming from the event side, but from other changes like weather reports, what have you, that also feed into this analytics system. So this would be from an architecture viewpoint a way to integrate the events that you collected from all these devices into a analytic system that might also be taking advantage of other data that is coming from other sources. Now all of these boxes here, every single box on this figure here, on this picture represents a cloud native service, which means you do not have to maintain VMs, you do not have to uh, monitor these machines. All these systems here are available as a service from a service UI. So you can do a pop sub and you don't have to worry about the queuing setup at all. Uh, you can do the transformation of data coming into BigQuery using a concept called data flow. Again, you're worrying about the data transformation aspects, the data cleaning aspect, but you do not have to worry about the underlying infrastructure. Same for BigQuery and the other systems. And on top, it's all global. So nothing here is restricted to a certain geography on the planet. This is all available everywhere. Now here's an, a different viewpoint. So here on the right, very right side, I have an application running in Kubernetes. Kubernetes, as you know, is available as a managed service, GKE, on the Google Cloud. That might implement some application logic, maybe fleet management. And it runs on Cloud Spanner as a, uh, a relational online transaction database. So these two boxes together are the application. And you can have events coming in from the InfluxDB collection through PubSub into Dataflow, which then feeds it into Spanner. And then these events are available as transactional data to the, let's say, inventory uh, application. Now here you can see the arrows go the other way too, not just from influx to the application, but the other way around. So you can have data coming from Cloud Spanner into InfluxDB if you need for the analysis at that point in time, if you need data that is not coming necessarily from the devices at this point in time, but maybe from devices that are managed elsewhere or from other data sets that you wanna have available to you. So it's a two direction, um, system that's possible here. So this is important because now you see that this is an ecosystem happening where events can feed other systems and other systems can feed the events. And now you only have the ability to combine data sets or insights over time. Another example we uh, briefly looked at that is the uh, machine learning. So on the right side, you have something called the AI platform. That's a service that provides you machine learning capabilities, learning, and uh, predictions, and there's online predictions right there. So you can invoke them or you can do batch predictions if you want to. And here you have the same mechanism again. You take the events, feed them into um, the AI engine, and in this case, you go from the pub sub from the topic-based system to a concept called Cloud Run into Cloud Storage. Now, Cloud Run is a service that allows you to submit code implement it in a Docker container. You submit the Docker image to the Google Cloud. It gives you back an entry point, an HTTP REST endpoint. And then you can invoke this endpoint and it gives you back whatever your code is doing. So this is a way to implement something like Cloud Functions, but in any way, which way it works in Docker. So you don't know, you're not restricted to the languages supported by Cloud Functions, but you can use any language you want and you can implement anything you can do in a Docker container, and you just submit the image and then you run the image, and when you have many requests coming in, then the Google Cloud scales up these containers for you, and there is a limit to that, but this limit can be uh, increased. So this gives you the ability, for example, to subscribe to a um, message in a topic. The message is delivered to that endpoint that you implemented, and it then can do the transformation, for example, right into cloud storage in a way that the AI platform can pick it up and do the machine learning. So here you have a service where you can submit code, but you do not have to worry about uh, virtual machine management. You do not worry, have to worry about scaling 
or any of that. You only kind of concentrate on implementing the logic inside a Docker image, and that image you make uh, register with the cloud, and then it does the invocation and does the scaling uh, on the spot as the demand increases when the invocations come in. And finally, we have the long-term storage. So one way of accomplishing that could be that you have a concept called a scheduler. So a scheduler is a configuration interface that allows you to have invocations on a regular basis. And you can say how many invocations should take place and when they should take place and how often they should take place. And one entry point is a cloud run Docker image. We talked about that. So you could implement a little piece of code that says I extract data from InfluxDB. I store the data in cloud storage for long term. And along the way, I delete it from InfluxDB because I deem this data not to be relevant anymore at this point in time for analysis. So now on this basis, it's under your control what data you extract and delete from the Time Series database and put it into long-term storage if you want to. And then you can have like this sliding window of actual data that remains and all the data you don't really need anymore, but you want to hold on to it. And so this is like one way to feed it into a long-term storage um, environment. Now, you could also use the same mechanism to feed it into another database. It doesn't have to be long-term storage because in Cloud Run, in these Docker images, you can implement any logic you want. So you could instead feed it into like an operational database or in some analytics database or into a, another queuing system if you want to. This is just an example how you could um, feed these events into uh, a long-term long -term storage. All right. So this is what we talked about, it was quite a bit, but this was from an architecture perspective. How would you go about such an architecture in context uh, of the services that you have in the Google Cloud on a global basis? Thank you very much. Now you have the floor. Any questions for Christoph? All right, Ivan. Christoph, I've got a question. What is the underlying uh, programming language that you would recommend for the IoT core at GCP? Is it Node.js? So, so IoT core gives you a certain set that you can use, so you have a choice. So there's less, uh, um, usually there's less a choice of yours, there's more a choice of what the service allows you to do. So go there, look, have a look, what languages it supports, and you can go from, from, from that viewpoint. Okay, so if I uh, go and open uh, the quick start, uh, GCP IoT core technology uh, shows uh, the Node.js right. as the first mm -hmm. option. Mm -hmm. So is this something that is uh, the most used, uh, or how do you view uh, the usage of programming languages uh, at, from the IoT perspective? Right, so I, I don't know what the, the average usage is because we cannot see what customers are doing, right? So one, one aspect, one interesting aspect of all of this is that we know that customers are using IoT Core but we have no insight into how they're using it because we cannot see customer data and what their configurations are. So I have no way to get an average or a most used uh, um, analysis out of the systems because we can't access them. So I have no, no the same on, on the, the Cloud Run, for example, right? So we only know customers are using Cloud Run because we see it in the billing system, but we don't know how many containers they have. We don't know what languages they are using because we can't access and we shall yeah. not access. So it's right. Right. right, so yeah. there's nothing, I mean, mm -hmm. sorry, but I can't give you stats on that. And the second question is, there was the link uh, between uh, the device and tick stack. Uh, can you elaborate more this link and the it first it column? Uh, it cloud IoT Core and tick stack. Yeah, so there is a um, connection. So there on, the, on the InfluxDB uh, website, you have a reference guide. Mm -hmm. 
and that reference guide is a step-by-step -step process that shows you how that link is set up between IoT Core and Kick Stack. And when you go through that, you see what all the steps are you have to do in order to get these two connected to each other. And so I think what underlying what happened is that the uh, Kick Stack has a plugin into the IoT Core in order to make this connection for you. You only have to configure it, you don't have to implement that. So it's a configuration setup between the two. It's not an implementation setup. I believe there's actually a blog post that um, articulates that as well. So right. if anybody's interested. Yes, yes, there's a blog post and then there's this reference guide, these step-by-step -step instructions that go together and that explain how that how this is set up. The, the thing that I really like about this architecture slide that you pulled up, Christoph, is that it's not just in the theoretical. I can think of many, many examples of our users that have implemented mm. their solutions with these various architectures. So there's, there's a number of um, energy producers that are taking, as you mentioned, weather forecast information, and actually they drive that back into the time series database because weather forecast plus the events that they're collecting, that combination actually can inform them to do something to those edge devices. And I'm sure many of you guys can think of uh, those scenarios as well. And then even you know in the um, middle DevOps kind of a, a use case with your um, Kubernetes and container management, there's um, many instances where you want to collect that information and also bring that back into your time series store for you know further analysis to understand you know what how the environments are working are there things that you have to change et cetera. So um, and and in our next talk with uh, Chris Goler, he's actually going to be sharing what he's doing in that line. Um, in as it regards to InfluxDB Cloud, the um, SaaS service. Um, and then on that third line, we also have um, a number of users that are also you know, trying to make predictions and they're actually bringing their predictions back into a time series database because oftentimes those predictions are time series data. And they'll bring them in for a couple of reasons. They'll bring them in because one, they wanna see, can they, um, they wanna track the accuracy of the predictions Right, and they can set alerts and thresholds. When there's not, there's an issue with that, they can fix that. Um, also, they've also just started to um, have their teams get accustomed to looking at dashboards that are written to the tick app for any of their data scientists or any other staff members that are gonna look at historical, real-time, and um, predicted um, time series data as well. So we actually see lots of these scenarios and arrows often going all the way back to the tick script as well. So this is a, a great representation of uh, some of the use cases that we see. And these are examples. I mean, these are examples how you could do it. And of course, you can do it in very different ways if you want to, because all these combinations of architecture components have different ways of interacting. It's not the only way they can interact. This is just one example of, of, of doing it, right? I mean, you could imagine that you filter uh, out from tick stack on a geographic basis if you need to have your data be data residency sensitive to stay in Europe, right? So you might want to have a system that only runs in Europe for these reasons, and then you feed out the data by geography because of data residency requirements. I mean, there's all the additional things you can think about in terms of the requirements, how this would change to, to make it happen. Right? This, is not, this is just only one, one possible example of all of this. Um, if you guys have any other questions, uh, Christoph's here all day, please you know, just reach out. We can always um, you know, set some time in the um, technical discussion room Otherwise, I can release you 10 minutes early for your break. <laughs>